good morning to everybody from your host, Ty Melbourne, along with our co-host Ty Dubai and Ty Islamabad. And a very good evening to everyone, especially our participants and followers in Australia. We welcome all the Thai chapter members, members and guests across the world. I am Sheila Edwards, Vice President of Thai Melbourne. I have the honor of being your host and moderator of today's events. I am going to do my very best to make the next two hours informative and intriguing, along with a knowledgeable lineup of panelists. I would also like to extend a very special welcome to Mr. Mahavir Sharma, the chairman of Thai Global, who is intently listening to us right now. For those of us who are non-Thai members who have joined us today, I'd like to share a little bit about Thai. Thai is a global organization fostering entrepreneurship. At Thai, the focus for our chapter members and our members is all about giving back. So, over to today's events. Now more than ever before in our history, we are faced with many challenges, cultural, moral, economic, health and planetary. The need for international and cultural understanding, inclusion, inspiration and unity, and the need for prevailing peace has never been greater. In Peter Frankopan's absorbing book of the New Silk Roads, and here I have a copy, the Oxford historian argues that while the best West obsesses with Brexit, European politics and Trump, what happens in the countries along the Silk Road, China, India, Russia, Pakistan, Central Asia, and the Middle East is ultimately shaping the century. Our economic dealings with the world has most definitely changed. So it is in this context, Time Melbourne remained determined to exploring the Silk Road along with our co-hosts, Thai Dubai and Thai Islamabad. As a young girl studying history in India, the tales of the Silk Road fascinated me. It was distant, vast, and remote. Fast forward about 40 years, it still remains mystical and unreachable in many parts. Today, we're going to attempt to journey the past, present, and the future of the Silk Road, to investigate with our learned and experienced panel of five, so I'm now going to take the pleasure in introducing them to you in order of today's program. Dr. Pradeep Taneja, representing Thai Melbourne, is the deputy head of the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Welcome, Dr. Pradeep Taneja. Thank you, Shila. Thank you. Mr. Imtiaz Rastagar from Thai Islamabad is an entrepreneur, founder, and chair of the Rastagar Group. Welcome, Mr. Istagar. Mr. Omar Khan is the director of international offices at Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Welcome, Omar. David Sellers will join Dr. Omar Khan from Thai Dubai. He is the Chief Representative in China at Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Welcome, David. Daniel, I beg your pardon. Tim Cope is our final panelist. He is an award-winning Australian adventurer and writer based in Melbourne with a special interest in Central Asia, Mongolia, and Russia. Welcome, Tim. Thank you. Each of Thanks our panelists each of our panelists will present aspects of their understanding, bringing us through the history, present day, and future dreams of the Silk Road as we now know it. We will then finally conclude with a 30 minute Q&A. We will also, during the program, be polling, and the first two questions will be coming your way very shortly.
Our first presenter, whom I'd like to introduce, is Dr. Pradeep Taneja. Dr. Pradeep Taneja is the deputy head of the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne, where his work focuses on Chinese politics and international relations. He is also a member of the Center of Contemporary Chinese Studies and an academic fellow of the Australia India Institute. He lived and worked in China for many years. His research interests and publications span the Himalayan divide, covering both China and India. He has been a visiting fellow at a number of think tanks in Asia and Europe, frequently interviewed by the Australian and international media on developments in Asia. He is the author of numerous publications and is currently working on a book looking at the rise of China from an Indian perspective. Today, Dr. Thaneja will present key aspects of the history of the Silk Road through the geopolitical journey leading us to the Belt and Road Initiative. Over to you, Dr. Pradeep Thank Thaneja. you, Sheila. Thank you. I feel like a bit of an interloper because the topic for today is the Silk Road, which is the domain of historians, and Thai is an organization of entrepreneurs. I'm neither. I'm neither a historian nor an entrepreneur. I'm a political scientist who works on the politics of Asia, politics of China, India, and the international relations broadly of the what we these days call the Indo-Pacific region. But I will begin with a bit of history of um, the Silk Road, and then I will get into the geopolitics of it. And I know that I've been allocated 20 minutes, so I'll try and be brief. Uh, as a university lecturer, I'm used to giving long two-hour lectures. So I'll see if I can do it within 20 minutes. Uh, so, uh, I understand the theme for today's event is the journey of the Silk Road, its past, present, and future. And I'm sure Tim Cope is gonna give us an interesting perspective on contemporary Silk Road countries, particularly in Central Asia. But I, as I said, I wanna begin with a brief uh, history. Um, and, um, okay, so ancient Silk Road, now, we know there's a common perception that Silk Road is something which has always been called Silk Road, that it might have been called Silk Road by the people who were traders on the road. But the reality is that the term or the name Silk Road or Silk Roads, as Franco Pine calls them, actually was coined by a German geographer. And, and that was also very recently, fairly recently in the late 19th century. So until the late 19th century, there really was no name as such for what we now know as the Silk Road. It's a little bit like Asia. You know, we all talk about Asia. We, many of us consider ourselves to be Asian. But when you ask yourself, if you speak in the audience, if you speak any Asian language, ask yourself, how do you say Asia in your language? And you will discover that there is no Asian name for Asia. Asia actually is a European construct. The, the name Asia comes from ancient Greek. So similarly now we have uh, the Silk Road, which actually was named by a German geographer. But uh, Silk Road really refers to, and when, when uh, Richthofen was talking about the Silk Road, he was really talking about the the trade between Han Dynasty China and, and Europe, and how that linked all the countries along the way. Uh, but regardless of whether Silk Road is a new coinage or something that's always been known this way, the reality is that Silk Road was a, a network, a very impressive network of caravan and shipping routes that crisscrossed the ancient lands uh, before the European imperialists arrived in, in Central Asia and, and Eastern Southern Asia. And what was traded on the Silk Road? The Chinese silk, 
ceramics, Indian cotton, precious stones, spices. In fact, spices became a major attraction, particularly for the Europeans, but also for, for others trading on the old Silk Road. And although uh, Richthofen calls it the Silk Road, silk was by no means the only commodity traded on the Silk Road. But there were many other commodities. In fact, some of the other commodities were traded at different times in history in greater volumes than silk. But because silk was one of the more important commodities, um, he, he uses the term Silk Road to describe this very complex network of um, tracks, essentially, because Silk Roads was never what we now know as roads. These were, these were tracks. And, and there was no, no individual state responsible for creating them. We are talking about a period where this essentially was a product of the, the, the spirit of adventure of traders and, and preachers and all sorts of other entities. So there was no state responsible for building the ancient Silk Road. And therefore, nobody can really take credit for Silk Road as being their creation. In terms of traders who, who, who plied this route with Sogdians, Indians, Persians, ancient Greeks, and of course later Arabs, they were the key, key trading nations and key trading communities on the ancient Silk Road. China was one of the countries that participated in the Silk Road network. So the perception that we have been uh, sort of uh, we, we've led to believe recently is that um, the Silk Road involved China as the hub and the trade and transportation routes radiated across Asia from China, uh, radiated across Asia and Europe and, and, and the rest of the world through China or from China. The reality, of course, was that China was one of the countries, one of the parties in the ancient Silk Road. And China, in fact, was never a major trading nation. So if you look historically, although Chinese goods like silk and ceramics and others were traded through the ancient Silk Road, but China itself was never a major trading nation compared to the many other, many other people and communities uh, of the time. And historically, with the possible exception of the Tang Dynasty, with the possible exception of the Tang Dynasty, China was quite insular for much of its history, very much inward looking, rather than a cosmopolitan culture, which absorbed influences from around the world. So India, for example, was much more cosmopolitan, much more open to other influences than China. And in fact, when the Europeans finally wanted to trade with China, and they wanted to sell their manufacture goods to China, and they wanted to buy Chinese silk and other Chinese commodities, they had to literally force open the Chinese door. They came to China, they wanted to trade with China, and the Chinese emperor said, our celestial empire lacks nothing. What can you barbarians offer to us? So that was the insularity of China at the time. So historically, China wasn't a major trading nation, even though Chinese commodities was sought after. In terms of the lingua franca, the language used by the traders on the Silk Road, for much of the history of uh, the Silk Road, and particularly during its heydays, Sogdian was the language of the Silk Road, not Chinese, and of course not English, which is now the, the lingua franca of international trade, but it was the Sogdian rather than any other language that dominated, although traders spoke their own languages and, and traders would learn from each other different languages. So there was a very impressive intermingling of cultures along the Silk Road. So let me move to my, my real sort of field of expertise, which is the contemporary geopolitics and therefore the new Silk Road and particularly the, Chi the Chinese initiated Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative, as you probably know, was initially called the One Belt, One Road Initiative. And here's a, a picture of uh, many of the world's leaders attending 
the Belt and Road Forum, the first Belt and Road Forum organized by Chinese President Xi Jinping in May 2017 in Beijing. Uh, you will notice that uh, many of the world leaders are missing from this picture. And that's because many of the consequential countries, in fact, have decided to stay away from the Belt and Road Initiative. They have not, they have not signed on to China's Belt and Road Initiative. So what is Belt and Road? Uh, or one belt, one road. And I put a footnote here that in 2015, the Chinese government decided uh, by declare, by issuing a statement from the National Development and Reform Commission and the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs that instead of translating Lu, the Chinese word for it, into English as one belt, one road, they would officially change the translation to, uh, to Belt and Road Initiative. The Chinese word still, the Chinese phrase is still one belt, one road, but the English translation is Belt and Road Initiative. And the reason for that, of course, was because there was criticism from many people who were critical of the one belt, one road initiative, because they argued that there are many roads. And even the old Silk Road was not one single road. There were many roads and, and there, you know, there, there, there are many corridors and belts around the world. So, be as it may, One Belt, One Road became the Belt and Road Initiative. And really, BRI is a shorthand for two grand schemes conceived by China's President Xi Jinping. One of them is, of course, a Silk Road economic belt, which is the land route. Surprisingly, it is called the belt, whereas the sea route is called the road. Uh, this Silk Road economic belt consisting of uh, a complex web of railroads, highways, oil and gas pipelines, power projects, in fact, a lot of power projects, stretching from Xi'an in Shanxi province in central China through Central Asia and Russia, going on to Moscow, Rotterdam, and Madrid. In fact, during the COVID-19, during this pandemic, the number of trains going from China to Europe uh, has increased. And in fact, there are nearly 50 trains a week currently going between China and, and Europe, although they only transport less than 2% of the, the cargo uh, freight which is carried between China and Europe, but still the number of uh, trains between China and Europe has increased along this route. The second component of the Belt and Road Initiative is the so-called Maritime Silk Road, which consists of a network of ports and other coastal infrastructure from, for example, Fuzhou in Fujian province in China's east coast, stretching across Southeast Asia, South Asia, East Africa, and the Mediterranean, and you know, terminating possibly in Duisburg or Venice or, or, or some other uh, port in Europe. So overall, it is an ambitious attempt to integrate the European landmass economically and politically with clearly some strategic consequences. And this is a map. It's unfortunately not the best map I could find, but this is a map that does show both the, the land and the sea route. And you can see in blue uh, below, there is the, the, the Maritime Silk Road, which is the sea route of the, the new Silk Road. And in the pink above, going from China to, to Kyrgyzstan and all the way via Turkey to, to Europe. And that's the, the, the land route of the Silk Road. And both of these routes were actually used historically. So this is, this is not uh, entirely uh, a, a, an invention, but this is something, these are the routes which were taken by the traders uh, through history. Now, in terms of what China's key objectives are, I have divided China's objectives into economic and geopolitical. The economic objectives are to integrate China more closely with the economies on its periphery. So the countries uh, that lie on the periphery of China from Southern Asia to, to Central Asia, to, to link these countries, to integrate these economies with that of China. So economic integration which of course is one of the foundational principles of globalization also, is 
So One Belt, One Road, or the BRI initiative, is designed to, to integrate these economies with that of China. It is also a way of finding a more profitable use for China's vast foreign exchange reserves. And China, as we know, is still sitting on nearly $3 trillion US in foreign currency reserves. So this is uh, also one way to look for more profitable, more efficient ways of utilizing China's foreign currency reserves. A, a third economic objective is to facilitate the restructuring of China's economy by deploying excess capacity in other countries. So China obviously over the last 40 years has been building up a tremendous uh, industrial capacity. And as Chinese economy continues to, to diversify and continues to move up the value chain, some of these capacities will become redundant. So for example, China has gone from being one of the smaller uh, producers of steel in the world. I mean, some of you might remember the Great Leap Forward in the late 1950s. During the Great Leap Forward, the objective of Chairman Mao was to catch up with Great Britain in the production of steel. And today, China, of course, is the world's largest producer of steel. China produces more than a thousand sort of million tons of steel. So China has gone from being a, a net importer of some of these commodities to be one of the largest producers of these commodities. So China has become, China has accumulated a lot of excess capacity and some of this capacity will have to find other homes. So part of the Belt and Road Initiative was to move some of this capacity, to deploy some of this excess capacity in other countries and along this Belt and Road Initiative. And, and finally, in terms of economic objectives, uh, it was to increase the long-term interdependence between China and the rest of Asia, Africa, and Europe. And this is linked to my, my first point here, which is to integrate, to integrate the economies of these regions. And by increasing integration, you increase interdependence. And interdependence means reduce chances of conflict, reduce chances of differences of opinion by creating greater interdependence. Let me now move on to um, the geopolitical objectives, the key geopolitical objectives of the Belt and Road Initiative. Clearly, the, even the initiation, the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative was a manifestation of China's growing geopolitical ambitions. Now, President Xi Jinping talks about a community of shared destiny. Uh, so the language used, of course, is very conciliatory, but, but the net effect of this in terms of China's own geopolitical ambitions is that this will certainly link many of these countries along the road to, to, to China's own geopolitical influence. It will limit American influence, or at least that is, that is one of the objectives, that by, by building the Belt and Road Initiative, China would be able to limit American influence and strategic space available to the United States, especially in what we nowadays call the Indo-Pacific region. Secondly, uh, in terms of geopolitical objectives, it will deliver security through economic development. And in my conversation with scholars and officials in China, for example, when we talk about when we talk about, for example, China-Pakistan economic corridor, and I'm sure we're going to hear about it a little later, but when you talk to Chinese scholars and talk about the, the, the objectives of the China-Pakistan economic corridor, they say that one of the key objectives would be to bring about economic development in China, and an economically developed Pakistan would be less vulnerable to extremism. And, and therefore, this is a transplantation of the Chinese model in Xinjiang, that if you build roads, if you build highways, if you create industries, it'll wean people, particularly young people, away from extremism. And therefore, this is another of those objectives, which is to deliver security to the region and security to China through economic development. And it is also, finally, to establish China as the preeminent global power without a war. In other words, through economic means, China wants to attain the, the status of a global power rather than 
through conflict. Now, we know if you look at the history of international politics, you look at the works of people like John Mearsheimer, the tragedy of great powers, often the transition, power transition, takes place through conflict. Uh, Graham Ellison from Harvard Kennedy School did a study of major power transitions in the world and found that out of 16, 12 times, the power transition was quite violent, in other words, through conflict. So one of China's geopolitical ambitions also is to avoid conflict, to, to achieve the great power status without actually you know, entering into any major conflict. And other, you know, people have had different opinions on what the Belt and Road Initiative stands for. Um, and I have here some examples. Uh, it's been described by a European, a Belgian scholar, Jonathan Halslag, as a thinly veiled aggressive export policy. So Jonathan Halslag reduces it to export policy. In other words, reduces it to trade. Uh, National Bureau of Asian Research in the US, uh, in one of their reports, Naji Rowland calls it, a tool for promoting national economic development by boosting exports, enhancing access to natural resources, and providing support to important Chinese domestic industries. Financial Times called it road to a new empire, a, you know, a global empire. But my favorite is this quote from Scott Kennedy, an American scholar who calls it, he said, Belt and Road Initiative is like a Christmas tree. You can hang a lot of policy goals on it. In other words, Belt, of, Belt and Road is everything and anything. In other words, whatever the Chinese officials decide to, to make it. So in China, for example, when I was talking to my academic colleagues at Peking University about you know, Belt and Road Initiative, this is in the early days when in 2013 and 14, and they said that many Chinese scholars who had applied for research grants and their applications were rejected they modified their research grants, included Belt and Road Initiative in the title of their grant application, and it got funded. So Belt and Road becomes, you know, many things to many people. Um, the Economist uh, described the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and its aim as its ultimate aim is to make Eurasia dominated by China an economic and trading area to rival the transatlantic one, in other words, the, the, the you know, Europe, American dominated transatlantic uh, trading and economic routes. Okay, that brings me to my final slide, and I know that I'm nearly at the end of my time. Um, what about the Belt and Road Initiative in the post COVID 19 period? And now we have, we've had many speculations, many scholars and, and um, intellectuals have, have thought about what the world is going to look like after uh, the, this pandemic ends. And there has been much speculation, but I'm going to limit myself to the, the Silk Roads or the Belt and Road Initiative and what the Belt and Road Initiative is going to look like. So far, China is believed to have invested nearly $450 billion in various projects around the world. Much of it is in loans. Some of it is investments by Chinese state-owned companies, but many of the investments also are funded by loans from China's two policy banks, China Development Bank and the Exim Bank. So a lot of it is, in fact, loans. But many governments in Asia and Africa are now asking China for the deferment of these loans. In other words, many of the governments find it difficult to pay back these loans or to pay the installments, and therefore they are asking China to defer these loans. China agreed to, to, to waive some of these loans as part of the G20 deal, but that really doesn't include these loans, the, the Belt and Road Initiative loans. China's own economy also, of course, has taken a major hit during the pandemic. China's growth rate collapsed because of the, 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 the economic sort of fallout from the pandemic. So many of the mega investment projects which were being announced from 2013 onwards, I think this is now a, you know, a passe. This is not going to happen. I mean, there will be still some big projects, but I don't think we are going to see the kind of announcements which were being made from Beijing you know, during the heyday of the Belt and Road Initiative. Also, China itself is likely to focus on smaller projects. I've heard from Chinese officials 
that they're going to focus on health, they're going to focus on agriculture, they're going to focus on services, project management services, but many of the big projects are probably not likely to be promoted by the Chinese authorities. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep. How, I'm fascinated by how quickly you summarized such, an, such a vast subject. Um, so appreciate um, you know, the fact that you've kept within the time. Um, we, what we're going to do is we're going to have um, a couple of questions, which, um, which um, I'm going to present to you. I think the first poll didn't actually um, get through for some reason. So I'm going to just relaunch that. Please take your time um, to um, answer those for okay. me, please. Um, so I'm going to do that. And um, in terms of the questions that I had, um, one um, question from um, Thai Dubai um, was, what is the impact of COVID um, in terms of the Belt and Road and other Chinese initiatives? Okay, uh, I think I kind of answered the question in my last yes. slide, um, where I, I, I argued that um, China, because China's own economy has taken a big hit during this crisis, plus Chinese financial institutions, particularly China Development Bank and Exim Bank, are finding that many of the countries were borrowed from China as part of the Belt and Road Initiative are asking for deferment of their capacity because their economies have taken a huge hit and therefore their capacity to repay these loans has been significantly undermined by COVID-19. And therefore, China itself is going to scrutinize any new lending much more carefully. They're going to really take the microscope to, to, to the lending in future. So in terms of countries that were looking at getting new funding from China for new infrastructure projects, particularly those big projects, I think they're going to be affected. China is going to focus much more from what I'm hearing on things like agriculture, helping some of the developing countries with agriculture, and China has considerable experience in, in agriculture technologies. It's going to focus on project um, consultancies rather than actually you know, big, giving huge loans for major infrastructure projects. So we are really going to see much less capital intensive projects and much more focus on making the best use of the limited resources that the Chinese government will have at their disposal. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep. Um, one um, other question, which I may just ask you very briefly is, um, uh, the question says, we, um, global trade has historically led to a wide dissemination and localization of ideas throughout the world. We can see this in religion, science, art, and even in the projection of power. How has this process changed today, in your opinion? I think globalization certainly, I mean, if you look at, you know, we're talking here about the Silk Road, and Silk Roads were a wonderful sort of way of cultural dissemination, sharing of knowledge, sharing of ideas. And, and we, I think, are all richer for the exchanges that took place along the Silk Road. And in our modern times, in our own sort of uh, life and times, we've seen that globalization, you know, particularly since the end of the Cold War, when most of the countries which used to be part of the old Soviet bloc also became part of the global economy, and countries like China, which came out of isolation to embrace globalization, we've seen tremendous benefits, not only China, but we've all benefited from globalization. It has broadened our horizon. We have learned new things. There have been new ideas, new technologies that have proliferated. In fact, product life cycles have become much shorter, largely because of you know, how new technologies have moved so rapidly. So that, that, has been, that has been the real benefit of globalization. So in many ways, uh, globalization, our contemporary experience echoes what happened during the Silk Roads in the heydays. Thank you. So um, I think we'll move on. Thank you very much, Dr. Pradeep. Um, we obviously, um, you know, continue being with us and we, we would love to um, obviously come back. 
Uh, we have a panel, um, you know, of uh, Q and A um, at the very end. So please, um, please stay on on um, on the link and on on Zoom. Um, I'd like to invite um, Mr. Imtiaz uh, Rastager now um, over to um, give us a little bit of his perspective. And let me introduce Mr. Imtiaz um, Ali Rastager, who is an entrepreneur and, as I said, founder and chair of the Rastager Group. Mr. Rastager is a manufacturing specialist and a consultant for marketing and exports. He is one of the best known entrepreneurs of engineering sector in Pakistan. He's been member of boards of several government organizations. Over the years, Mr. Rastager has participated in inception of various trade bodies, Islamabad Chamber of Commerce and Industry, PAPM, which is the Pakistan Association of Automobile Parts and Accessories Manufacturers, and other um, such associations. Um, we look forward to hearing from him um, on the benefits and the aspirations that the Silk Road has brought to his region. So welcome, uh, Imtiazji, um, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Sheila. Um, very grateful for having me here on this forum. And first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Pradeep, a very well-researched uh, paper and um, obviously he speaks with a lot of depth about the history and the economic considerations and geopolitical objectives uh, of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and the history of it. And uh, of course, what it leads to for culture and the benefits of globalization. I am enriched by his um, uh, talk. And uh, some of the things which I would like to uh, bring before my uh, audience uh, is uh, ex uh, excuse me I I want to bring my uh, just one moment yes uh, here I am with my uh, presentation and some of the things which I will be speaking about today are also uh, have been mentioned by uh, Dr. Pradeep, but uh, the difference uh, would be somewhere that uh, I am a businessman and an entrepreneur all my life. So uh, I'm looking at the same thing maybe from a slightly different or from a, let's say, a little shallow uh, perspective from the business perspective. But uh, these are really my perceptions of the Silk Road and I'm also part of the theater living in Pakistan and seeing our uh, uh, own uh, belt initiatives coming up, uh, which we call CPEC. So basically, my, uh, you know, this is an equation, you know. Uh, we, when we call Silk Road, we, it's actually an equation. Supply meets demand. And uh, uh, basically, wherever there is a demand and something moves to supply, uh, meet that demand, the supply side, then they create a route to doing it. It's like it's about talking about flow of goods and it's about leading to flow of culture also uh, because when people move, they also in interact with other people. And as the world moved on from the Middle Ages and before, then, you know, as it, passports came into being, visas, customs were created and we also created the term smuggler. You see, actually what the smuggler is, he was basically a trader. And we have a lot of these people in northern areas of Pakistan who have been trading. And here you can see two things only I put here. Dalda and Preet Blade, made in Pakistan, being sold in markets in Moscow. So, you know, and this is, this is not going through any a formal route, there are people who take these goods, we don't know how they take them, but you know, they take them all through Central Asia and these goods are trading in Russia. So, so this the is... MPIC, really I'm yeah. just going to interrupt for a moment. I think the presentation is not being shared, so I'm wondering... Oh, is that so? The... I'm... Oh, I beg your pardon. Would you like us some assistance here from this end or? Uh, sure. Let me go to Zoom. Uh.
If you need any assistance, please let us know. Yes, uh, I'm trying to uh, share the screen right now. And he's asking me questions, who can share only host or all panelists? Uh, who can start sharing? Do, do you, do you, have you given me the rights to share this? Uh, just click, click on the screen, uh, screen share at the bottom of your screen. Yes, I did that. Okay, 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 right. Thank you. Now I think I have it now. Right. Uh, Excellent. Yeah. Yes. So this is really the first slide I was talking about. Where okay, can you um, also go on to the slideshow onto the screen? Yes, please. Uh, Thank you. Excellent. So I'm so, sorry. We can continue so no now. Problem. So here you can see two products made in Pakistan. One is made in Lahore and one is made in Hyderabad, Pakistan. And these are sold in Moscow. So you see, and they, they, this is not a formal trade route, but they go from here to Gilgit and Gilgit to Kashgar and Kashgar to beyond, you see. So uh, there are goods that are flowing. And what I'm trying to say is that um, this is really uh, a flow of goods when we talk, talk about um, uh, the Silk Road. So then, you know, their trade patterns have created these trade routes. As Dr. Pradeep just mentioned, you see, there, there were, these were, some of them were dirt roads, some of them, but they were really trading routes. And we like to discuss some of them, uh, but there are a lot of this. Dr. Pradeep also mentioned about uh, uh, Peter Frankopan. I just put his book on top here because there are many kinds of, you know, traditional goods movement, like he mentioned. But then there was this Indian spices route, which created later on the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal. Then there are Gulf oil routes. There are slave trade of Liverpool was another Silk Road for some people supplying um, African people to uh, the farmers of uh, the Southern United States. Then there was a copper trade route from Belgian Congo to uh, Europe to facilitate the war in Europe. Arm supply Silk Road, narcotics and the dark web, and its IT and electronics, finance and investment stocks. And more recently, it's Alibaba and Amazon. In a way, they are also routes to getting things from one side to the other. So, so there are many ways of looking at Silk Road. And uh, now coming back to what was the initial program is that, uh, as Dr. Sahib has already mentioned, there's the Maritime Silk Road and then the Land Based Road, which is now called the BRI. And uh, there are geographic locations, the Eastern Silk Road, Western Silk Road, regional links like the Caspian Trade Corridor, Kazakhstan, and with uh, Turkey trying its own neighborhood, uh, to be connected to the main Silk Road. So there are many uh, things happening uh, around this initiative. And one of the things I like to bring to your attention is the collapse of the Soviet Union and how it facilitated the land-based East-West connections and how it also coincided with the rise of China. Because China in the Mao era, it developed its mines and later on went on to develop the downstream value threads and it had a huge appetite for technology and at one point in the late 80s they were digesting like 5000 joint ventures and technology agreements per year and then comes Deng Xiaoping and the rise of China's market economy and China becoming the factory of the world so obviously with all that much goods and available and a cash rich economy, China had to burst open and get to the world. So that brings us to China's trade diplomacy, uh, which eventually got together people from so many nations. You saw the pictures of them. And it led to this Belt and Road Initiative because China had technology, it had large corporations which would come out and be able to deliver infrastructure projects. It had the cash to fund them. And then it had the goods to sell on those things, on those infrastructure, those projects and in those markets. So they had to bring, build infrastructure, ports and roads mainly and power projects. 
and try to develop the host countries so they can also uh, participate in that prosperity so that also brings us to a little bit to the great game and the disturbance created by china the great game basically was uh, the uh, cloak and dagger game played between uh, the british on one side and the uh, zaris russia on the other side the zaris russia had ambitions to come to the warm waters of the indian ocean and but they were thwarted by all these nations at that time and then later on all this became soviet union all these uh, uh, central asian states were uh, taken up by the soviet union and then th this became like an iron curtain on both sides so nobody could travel through them uh, freely as it was expected so this continued for some time till uh, the collapse of the soviet union and now we have this initiative going exactly through these nations so at this point in time uh, uh, again this is a repetition from uh, dr pradeep says but here you will see that uh, while china is uh, also finding its own routes to different destinations like the british did in their time so china is de developing ports around the world it's doing and then it is also trying to cope up with threats uh, of interventions for example at the state of malacca so they have done two three things at the state of malacca they are working with uh, thailand to build a canal through thailand through which they will shorten the shipping route as well as uh, circumvent the state of malacca but at the same time if you see here uh, uh, here is uh, another uh, red uh, line i have drawn and this is from somewhere kunming in yunnan province of china coming down to yangon is another uh, road system being built so where china will have a much shorter route to indian ocean or to the bay of bengal so all this is happening uh, because of uh, uh, china's uh, uh urge to get into world markets and also as uh, dr pradeep has said that the ge geopolitical situation also uh, dictates this kind of uh, work from them on the other hand uh, india itself has its own uh, ambitious plan for its own internal silk road uh, which is called sagarmala network and sagarmata is also a very intelligent uh, way of linking all the uh, uh, coastal industrial towns with the interior of uh, uh, india and uh, rapid movement of goods so all this is also happening uh, uh, around us then it come brings us to the uh, railway network of cpec cpec now i move to the situation in pakistan uh we have uh, uh, two uh, sides of it one is the railway network where we are planning we still have not made much progress on this but we have plans for high speed uh, rail networks uh, across the country uh, so that is one of the things and here uh, there is a big interest from china and pakistan to work together on this then uh, the highway network of cpec let me tell you that uh, Uh, this uh, network was already uh, in the making in 1995 and since then around that time we started building our first motorway from peshawar to islamabad and islamabad to lahore and it continued to grow and uh, by now we have a fully functioning uh, high speed motorway all the way from peshawar to karachi and uh and this is a most of this is a six lane motorway uh very well planned and very very modern so and this it, it has fitted in with the rest of the bri initiative but this was mainly a pakistani initiative but then there is the western route if you see uh, uh, the the present route is here Uh, which we were already producing uh, 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 constructing and now here is the uh, the new route uh, the western route going all the way to gwadar 
and in between will be some interlinks here. Uh, this route is uh, basically a supply line to China, as well supply lines from China, linking China to the uh, Indian Ocean, uh, where China has um, uh, is, is a partner in development of the Gwadar port. And uh, here, this is this is again this is the real part of uh, uh, CPEC, which is part of the. Uh, uh, BRI. So, so this is this is where, where Pakistan is at this moment, and many parts of this western route are already under construction, and as well as uh, the Gwadar port. And here is a map of uh, manufacturing clusters in Pakistan. This is uh, taken from the website of one of my companies. Its name is Spoon Pneumatics. And uh, it's a service company for uh, industrial machinery. And we have here all the different industrial clusters in Pakistan, wherever they are, they are here in this map. And uh, so when you have good roads, they speed up communication, the logistics is good, bring down the cost of production. So we are all benefiting from these roads already. But as we link up with China, we'll see some more economic activity. And, and also what we are looking at is along the other route, we are uh, building different, uh, we call it EPZ, uh, economics zones. And these economic zones uh, are being, will partly be built, uh, we will have foreign capital coming in, or Chinese and maybe other people, because and they would be mainly resource based. Uh, they would be clusters of industries with, with special uh, emphasis on whatever is uh, the raw material available in those uh, economic zones. And this is CPAC and the regional conductivity. Uh, here you can see uh, where we have uh, uh, the green uh, line. Uh, this is, and uh, you see we have Jalalabad, from Peshawar to Jalalabad, there is a, already we have good roads, but again, this is a connectivity, and then from Jakababa to Kandhar, and Chaman, and to Taftan, and Zahidan beyond. So this is all our local land-based uh, connectivity. And then, of course, we already have this coastal highway from uh, Karachi to Gwadar. This is a fully functioning coastal highway. Uh, but the uh, the rest of the west sorry i beg your pardon there was some disturbance hello yes we can hear you mr intias oh, just one moment because uh, there was a disturbance from outside and uh, 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 have we got much more um, to go or shall we um no, 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 no. I have still to. Uh, I, I, I lost my presentation somewhere because of this. Uh, I can definitely see it on screen. You can see it. Okay, wonderful. I can. So it's probably hidden behind your zoom. Uh, do, do, do you get it now? Can you? It's there. Um, now you can see it. Yes, we can. Yeah. So, so this is the local. Uh, uh, situation uh, with our western neighbors and this is a little map of uh, Gwadar. It's a deep sea port. Uh, it used to be uh, already functional before Dubai came along and this is where there was um, large transshipment of goods uh, to smaller vessels going into the Gulf. But then as the Gulf developed and there was lack of interest on the part of uh, our authorities to develop this port. So Gwadar lost its business. And now, in a different way, it is being developed uh, again as a deep sea port. So what it means for Pakistan, uh, CPAC and the BRI, that we are developing great infrastructure. Uh, we already have developed enough power to foster our industrial growth. Uh, we are now uh, surplus in, in electricity at this moment and special economic zones leading to development of local regions and active trade route to Middle East and collaboration with China and other countries for trade. So these are some of uh, what we are looking forward 
from the Pakistani side from this uh, Silk Road. And coming down to earth, you see, it's all about business enterprise. When they're enterprising people, you know, they go out and find opportunities. They look for collaboration. They look for value threads. They look for business processes where they can fit in. So it's all about entrepreneurship and matching supply to demand. And this is what Thai is all about because Thai provides the opportunity for networking, for uh, uh, discerning certain types of trade patterns, finding opportunity, collaborating, and creating wealth. So this is what Thai is about. And in Pakistan and particularly in Thai Islamabad, we have uh, been able to uh, create a, a large crop of very young entrepreneurs. And our town is full of uh, uh, startups here. And uh, some of them are hitting the global market. So, and Thai has played a big role uh, in this. So that is all from myself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Imtiaz Rastagar. Um, we really enjoyed that, especially from your own perspective and uh, taking us through, um, you know, the stories that, you know, for me, I, I, I still remember as a young girl, um, dalda, you know, it was very much used in our um, cooking process. So, um, you know, absolutely uh, relate to that. Um, now I've um, we uh, we might just um, leave the questions for now, and we might go um, you know take some of uh, questions for your segment um, at a later point. Right. Um, so um, thank you once again, and uh, I might actually send out a second uh, polling um, um, a question to you, um, you know, first to the viewers. Um, and um, that way they can start doing the polling whilst we um, introduce the next, um, next uh, speakers. So um, we have from uh, Thai Dubai, Mr. Omar Khan. Um, Omar Khan is, as I said earlier, the Director of International Offices at Dubai Chamber of Commerce and industry leading the global development and management of Dubai Chamber. He currently manages 11 offices across Eurasia, Africa, and Latin America. Prior to his current position, Omar held consecutively successful leading positions at Dubai Chamber in various leadership roles, during which he helped to transform Dubai Chamber from having a customer-centric department to being a customer-centric organization. Omar has trained special impl and Im help implement the ATA CONAT system across the region and regularly participates as MC, presenter, and speaker for Dubai Chamber. Prior to his time with Dubai Chamber, Omar worked for HSBC Middle East Bank as a relationship manager in the commercial banking sector. We, um, Omar will be joined by Daniel Sellers, also from Thai Dubai, and I'd like to introduce Daniel to um, the listeners and viewers today. Um, Daniel um, is the Chief Representative in China at Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Daniel focuses on developing the Chamber's network of stakeholder relations in China and assisting member companies with market expansion. He has over 10 years experience in China working for foreign government and semi-government bodies in trade facilitation and policy advocacy roles. He is also an honorary trade arbitrator appointed by Shanghai Chamber of International Commerce under the Shanghai government. Daniel is fluent in Mandarin, and I wish I could say that, but I certainly have to go a mile before that, and a graduate of University College Dublin and Renmin University, Beijing. As I said earlier, Daniel, Stellas, and Omar Khan will jointly present to us the Middle Eastern contributions to our understanding of the modern day Silk Road goes through Dubai. Welcome to both of you, Daniel and Omar. Okay, good evening everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you here today and I hope wherever you are in the world uh, everything is going well for you and the situation uh, in your country is getting better and better. Uh, today me and Omar decided to join together to give you a perspective on how the Silk Road uh, influences Dubai's 
current relationship with China. So we want to dive into a little bit of the history of the Silk Road and how it influenced the Arab region, how people from that region were already trading and doing business with China for thousands of years, and now how that influences how Dubai participates in the modern Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so I've been in China for 10 years, so I've seen a lot of changes in terms of society and the economy. So I want to add a bit from that perspective, while Omar, of course, grew up in Dubai, so he saw a lot of hands-on examples of Chinese people emigrating to Dubai or investing in Dubai, so he knows from the business and the personal perspective, uh, and also the historical perspective, uh, what went on. So we're going to start off the first part where Omar is going to chat a bit about the historical side uh, from the BC era all the way up to 2000, the year 2000, so I've given him a big chunk. And I'm going to take it from the year 2000 up until the present and talk a tiny bit after about the future and, and what it might hold. So, Omar, I'll lead it to you now. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you, everybody, for being here. It's a great pleasure to sit and share some of our experience and also to learn from uh, the speakers as well. So I do have a big chunk, but it's been... It's, some, it's been somewhat uh, uh, active in different parts of the world, uh, you know, from 2000 BC to early AD. Uh, the trade, of course, has been always happening, but a lot of it's going from, from Asia to Persia, across to uh, the Mediterranean, and, and then eventually, but it really started uh, growing as uh, in the 7th uh, seventh, seventh century AD, eventually when when the Islamic empire started to expand and of course naturally trade and business started uh, to grow. And as was mentioned before, there was of course the, the Silk Route and, and then the, the Maritime Route as well were different and they were not called a Silk Route and uh, it was a very late name. And that's why my daughters get confused when they, uh, they keep saying ancient Greece and, uh, and then they hear about uh, Sparta, Marathon, uh, um, Macedonia and so on and so forth and they get confused and I said that is the name that we eventually gave to it when we refer to that period and it's the same thing so so uh, there's been a lot of different trade routes developing and it was very organic as, as was mentioned uh, before uh, and of course throughout the ages as the Islamic Empire grew of course we, we connected through India and then eventually through China and so uh, there was a lot of organic growth there, uh, especially on the Chinese side, uh, where uh, where we we saw some trade, especially during the after the the, the Mongolian uh, Empire uh, kind of adopted Islam and, and went and absorbed a lot of the cultures that it was expanding into. So with that, there was a slow growth and eventually into the Red Sea. Now, if we fast forward into a more closer time, the Dubai is just around 200 years old in, in modern Dubai. And, uh, and the, 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 the Gulf, the Arabian Gulf also was a slow, a very small hub for trade, a fishing village, but also it's, it should be noted that a lot, of, a lot of the spices came through Dubai, a lot of the, 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 the perfumes, the oils and everything else and the silks and the textiles through India, which became a meeting point between China and, and, and our region. But eventually Dubai slowly started to grow. One important factor was that 40% of the global pearls, natural pearls, were from the bed of the Arabian Gulf. So again, this was a major industry in that time, and it was growing, but it was, there was a concentration. But as we moved closer into, you know, into, uh, into the 20th century, we saw the development, uh, uh, the advent of some economies uh, discovering oil, still taking time. The UAE was a very late comer to that. But in 1937 as well, we saw some of the impact in terms of the trade, uh, the trade routes because our industry, pearl diving industry, was completely wiped out. So we learned some very valuable le lessons there. But in that time, we, we took the time to absorb as well uh, a lot of cultures. A lot of the first uh, uh, cultures that we absorbed was, of course, the people from Persia, from Iran, uh, from Baluchistan, and many different places that used to come here, work here, live here, and of course, uh, 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 you know, became Emirati citizens, like myself included. Then, of course, we were very close with, the, uh, with the India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and, so, and, and, as, and even Africa, and, and East Africa as well. Uh, and, and so Dubai became a hub, a melting pot of culture, where we absorbed the cultures, we got to know the languages, we, we were very flexible, we were very open society, and we started to grow. And even some businessmen from China, very 
very, uh, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the late 60s and 70s were, were coming here. And we also have Emiratis now who are half Chinese and half, uh, you know, Emirati. So, and many other nationalities as well now. So this shows the kind of attitude that we've developed and that always facilitates our business. So again, we, we, we developed a lot of strengths in language and culture and, and trade and everything. But China was still, we were not scratching the surface yet. Daniel, if you go to the next slide, so, or the, uh, the next portion, yes. So if you look at our relationship, if we fast forward uh, from that, that huge chunk that Daniel assigned to me to 1984, where diplomatic relations started to begin with, with China, China slowly coming on on the map. We, have, we had about a, a 250 million uh, trade with China. And of course, part of China is Hong Kong. And Hong Kong was in the UAE, the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, came here in the 70s as well, opened their offices. So slowly we started to see the product of China, just as Korea, as Japan started out very humbly, and slowly in, improve their technologies. We kind of saw the trends and we knew that there's a conveyor belt of different economies in the East that are growing. And we had an opportunity to continue to grow with them and by being relevant to their economies. So if, if we can go to the next slide. So here's where, just before I hand it over to Daniel, here is a pivotal moment in the history of the relationship, the bilateral relationship and the cultural relationship and the diplomatic one. Uh, around the, you know, China has already become a manufacturing powerhouse at, at the advent of the early 2000s. It's accelerated the ascension to WTO. Uh, and of course, we, we started uh, to uh, connect China through the Jabal Ali port and free zone with the goods. And of course, uh, we registered about uh, 2.5 billion US dollars in bilateral trade. So that's, that's a very strong growth in, in for, for Dubai at that time and the 1990s. Now, here was the challenge as well. I used to be in HSBC, the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation. I used to work with companies and businesses. I was very lucky enough to be assigned to the companies in the traditional and oldest bazaar called Murshid Bazaar. If it's one of the oldest neighborhoods and business areas of Dubai. It's near the Gold Soup. And I used to go there and I used to meet the traditional companies there. So there were companies from Iran, uh, like uh, Iranian heritage uh, business owners. There was people from Bohra. Uh, businessmen who were very well, well known in building materials, they, they handled that or they cornered that market there. And of course, as I was going to speak to them about what's happening to the business, what's changing, and we were also in the bank actually getting, insisting on more audited financials, more regulation and governance and transparency in the businesses and less name lending. We were seeing that the businessmen would tell us, oh, we are having a challenge. At that point, they were saying that uh, out of the three shops, now one out of three shops is a, is a Chinese shop. And these shops have, are very valuable. They have high key money. And they said, this is very tough. They, they, the Chinese businessmen would come. They'd have high incentives from the government. They would come in and they would compete. And they have, they, they have very good prices because of the incentives they get. And even if, if and, and that reduces, it increases the competition, reduces the cost and, and the profitability. And so, and so they were saying, look, we're, we're, we're having facing tough competition and if one shop doesn't make it the next one comes in and eventually they said it's going to two shops now so at that point of the business community the old traditional business community in the in the traditional bazaar was was in dire straits and dubai also had looked at looked at this and of course they were speaking to dubai now dubai was looking at china at the same time and looking at the business community they were looking at the powerhouse of the economy of china and looking at, of course, what it will become, projecting, and, and thinking, what should it do? What part should it play? It's a huge tsunami of business, manufacturing, and products. And it could take the decision to, to, to sort of fight it and put up barriers, but that was not the Dubai way. Dubai is an open market. We, our airports are open-air airports. We believe in competition, and we believe that the consumers and Dubai gets the best deal when there's good, healthy competition. So in turn, they thought about this and they thought, let's embrace this change. Let's get closer to China. At that time, of course, China was, was looked at like a, sort of a, a faceless uh, a sort of a monolith. The, the Chinese businessmen are coming. And, and, and we didn't have that understanding of the culture, understanding of the history, understanding of the geographies, the provinces and the ports and so on and so forth. 
So that was a starting point where we decided to actually get closer. And that's when we decided to make some of the moves that Daniel's going to talk about to understand the culture, to understand the, neg the generational differences, the out. Uh, what the goals with the Indian culture, the Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Sri Lankan, and Filipino, as well as the Iranian, and, and because that was part of our strength. And so Dubai, going on to 2000 and 2003, instead of going against the tsunami, they decided to surf the wave and to add value to a, a potential partner that they saw coming in. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over uh, to Daniel, who's going to actually talk now and get more into the business side of what happened and all the different buildups in our relationship with China. Daniel, over to you. Okay, thank you, Omar. Yeah, so as Omar says, 2000 is this pivotal moment. You either fight it or go with it. And Dubai very much uh, decided to go with it. In 2000, China had been basically been opening up for 20 years through its special economic zones in the south and had built a lot of manufacturing capability. And it was going through this very aggressive export led growth model and growing at 10% a year. And it had already taken note of Dubai as a potential portal for Chinese goods to enter the region. I remember for the last 30 or 40 years, the leadership in Dubai had been investing heavily in Dubai's infrastructure, in Dubai airport, in Jebel Ali port, and building up that business environment. And we can see now at this point, some of that investment starts to pay off in terms of the relationship with China. So 2004, we see the establishment of Dragon Mart, which is effectively, it's a wholesale market for Chinese goods in Dubai, but it's absolutely huge if you ever get a chance to visit it. And it started in 2004, and this was a very novel concept, the idea of bringing Chinese factory owners and traders to Dubai, displaying their wares there, and then importers and buyers could come and visit and uh, do the business directly from this center. Uh, but the idea really took off because I think it captured the spirit uh, of the Silk Road a bit, and it captured the spirits of boat nations for, for hundreds of years. Emiratis had been trading through Dubai as a pearl in a diving village, and for thousands of years, boat cultures had been trading along the Silk Road. So the Dragon Mart moment actually proved to be a very sharp catalyst in the increase of trade and in the increase of cultural exchanges between Dubai and China. So let's remember around 2000, the trade was at 2.5 billion US dollars, and this is all non-oil trade, any numbers I quote. So just 10 years later, it's almost seven times larger. And back in 2000s, the number of tourists visiting Dubai were relatively negligible. And in this short time, direct flights were established. We're now seeing 150,000 uh, Chinese tourists visiting Dubai a year, which is a lot of people actually. Uh, and then oil and gas, this wasn't happening there, but for a long time, China had already been buying oil and gas from UAE and from Saudi Arabia and the rest of the region. So China was very reliant on this region to fuel its manufacturing and export-led infrastructure development uh, growth models. So it becomes more and more dependent and it becomes more and more in their interest to have a very good, strong business relationship with the UAE and vice versa. Um, so at this point, trade now is increasing rapidly, tourist numbers increasing rapidly, bilateral investments increasing uh, a lot. And China announces the Belt and Road initiative in 2013 and they also announced the asia infrastructure development bank and it's actually uh, not just for geopolitical reasons did the ua decide to be uh, a founding member of the bank and an active participant in the bra the bra actually played into a lot of the strengths that dubai was already focusing on so for a long time dubai's leaders were focusing on building dubai as a hub in the gulf as a hub in the GCC Africa uh, Manasseh region. And some of that investment was now starting to pay, pay off. While the Belt and Road primarily is focused on investing in mostly trade and energy related infrastructure in developing markets. And most of this has gone to developing markets in uh, Africa, in the Southern Hemisphere and Southeast Asia. So a lot of this is going into the Southern Hemisphere and Dubai realized that it was well placed to capitalize on some of these new trade flows that were going to be created from the Belt and Road. So as Chinese construction materials and other goods are flowing through to North Africa or to the GCC, some of this will go to Dubai. Our Dubai's logistics industry will benefit from it. Our Dubai's meeting and exhibition industry will develop it. Uh, our Dubai's finance industry will benefit from it. So this is the typical model that Dubai has been using uh, for the last 20 or 30 years. And the BRI actually complements it nicely as it builds up the trading and uh, business uh, consuming capabilities of Southern Hemisphere emerging economies. Uh, so by 2015, uh, the bold countries took the next level 
in their relationship, they launched a investment fund, a built and rod fund, which was managed by the um, the sovereign funds of both countries. Uh, the number of Chinese living in Dubai reached 150,000, uh, and and this is a lot. So, by different estimates, Dubai's population ranges between you know 2.5 and 3 million. It might have been a little bit less back then. So already the Chinese diaspora in Dubai were representing about five or six percent of the population. Uh, and 2016 uh, is also the year that we established our Dubai Chamber office in Shanghai with the goal of helping our 250,000 members create more business and exchange with Chinese companies. So around 2014, 2015, the number of tourists uh, from China to Dubai had grown to around 400,000 annually, and the UAE took the, um, the, landmark, decision, the landmark decision to, to introduce visa on arrival scheme for Chinese. Uh, so this made it very easy for Chinese tourists to come to Dubai in the following year, China introduced that for the UAE. So within four years, between about 2015 and 2019, the number of Chinese tourists to Dubai doubled to 800,000, and the number of Chinese living in Dubai increased to between 180 and 200,000. So that's representing about eight or nine percent of the population, which is a very large Chinese diaspora. Uh, so trade at this stage peaked in 2017 at around 50 billion. So again, up around 2.5 billion 20 years ago. And when President Xi Jinping visited uh, the UAE in 2018, they decided that they wanted to enforce uh, more cooperation under Belt and Road Trading and Cultural Exchange. And they set a target of 200 billion bilateral trade uh, within the next 15 years. So this is just an example of some Chinese culture in Dubai. Uh, if you've ever been to Dubai around January or February, June, Chinese New Year, it would be hard to miss some of the celebrations. You can see the Burj Khalifa lighting up in red and Chinese characters there. Uh, you can see lanterns or fireworks. You can see performances at Dubai Airport. Throughout the year, there's various cultural and entertainment festivals that have a Chinese flavor to it. Um, you can see Chinese restaurants, authentic Chinese restaurants scattered around Dubai, not just in the malls, maybe those kind of newer ones that might be changed. You can actually go into the old Dubai, go into Dera, uh, and you might find some actually very authentic Chinese restaurants that have been set up by people who immigrated to Dubai 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, China uh, is an active participant in the expo. Uh, Dubai World Expo 2020 was due to be held this year, but it will now be held next year. And China has invested a lot in their pavilion. And this is mainly because China knows the power of a World Expo. China held the World Expo in 2010 in Shanghai. And this is one of the major moments when China came onto the world stage, along with the 2008 uh, Beijing Olympics. So they know the power that, uh, that an expo, expo can bring in terms of exchange, business opportunities and cooperations. So we're expecting uh, Expo to be a huge catalyst for more exchange under the BRI with China as long as the COVID situation can be brought under control. So what is Dubai's role in the modern Belt and Road Initiative? Well, first of all, it's a hub for Chinese companies that are going out into the region, particularly state-owned enterprises, SOEs. Uh, all of these projects really the first stage is done by big state-owned construction, engineering, and power companies. And then the lending either comes from the big four Chinese banks or the two development banks. Um, so Dubai is representing a hub where a lot of these companies who have projects in the Gulf region or have it in, in the uh, MENA region, they're setting up their MENA headquarters in Dubai and they're using it to manage it or they're even setting up a treasury or a finance function as well. The big four Chinese banks are also in Dubai International Financial Center. And one of these banks is uh, approved as an RMB clearing center, which effectively makes Dubai the second offshore clearing center, a RMB clearing center in the Middle East. So this is going to allow more RMB denominated contracts and it's going to help more RMB flow into the Gulf to Dubai. And again, this is something the Chinese side want as well. They want to internationalize the RMB. And the fact that Dubai is doing it brings it closer. Uh, to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, as a trade hub, I mentioned Dubai is excellently located between the Belt and the Road. Um, in 2019, the bilateral trade was roughly 42 billion. Of that 42 billion, 90% of it was China exported to Dubai. And of that 90%, about 65 to 70% of that is re-exported. So a lot of Chinese exports to the uh, Middle East, North Africa region actually goes through Jebel Ali port or goes through Dubai Airport. So it's already performing that function. So uh, it is to be expected as long as Dubai can continue to stay on top of its game, improving its regulatory uh, infrastructure and business environment. It is well placed to gain uh, some advantage from all these new trade flows 
uh, that will be created from the Belt and Road Initiative. In terms of the cultural aspect of the BRI, there's now 250 to 300,000 Chinese living in the UAE, almost 200,000 living in Dubai. Again, that's a very large number, representing almost 10% uh, of the population. And at its peak before coronavirus, we were expecting 800,000 visitors. We would hope in a year of Expo we could break that 1 million mark, but it would all depend on the uh, coronavirus. So things were very much on the up in terms of the figures uh, pre-coronavirus, so we'll have to see what's, what's going on next. And there's also a number of cultural programs and uh, education programs going on. A lot of young UAE people are starting to learn Chinese. It's available in school. Uh, it's coming to China, China to study or Chinese going to Dubai to study. Uh, Dubai Chamber participated in a program held by uh, Falcon and Associates. It's an event company owned by His Highness Al Maktoum, and we chew this uh, initiative, we participated in an internship program where we hired interns from China and one of those interns is now, seven years later, is the head of our Shenzhen office. Uh, Belt and Road, when you think about it, it's usually focused around infrastructure. It's usually, you hear about countries in Southeast Asia or Africa getting a big loan to build a big bridge, a big port, or a road, a highway system or rail. This is the traditional um, model of the BRI and we all already heard uh, in very good detail what's the focus and what's the strategy of China behind these investments. But in terms of Dubai and the UAE, it's not as relevant. I mean, there is some Belt and Road infrastructure investment in Dubai, but it's more focused on more modern new infrastructure. Dubai already has excellent ports, roads and highways. Um, it already has that ability to be a connector. So it's more in line with new infrastructure, things like solar, 5G, uh, technology, and anything around trade. So, you know, Building, a, building or expanding a terminal or building a warehousing and, show, and uh, product showcase center uh, in, in Dubai. That's another uh, Belt and Road project which I'm about to show you. Daniel, so these are just some examples of, yes? I'm just wondering whether some of these examples might come up in some of the questions because I can see some questions coming through. Um, I'm wondering, um, are you almost near your um, end of your presentation? Yes, last slide. Lovely. Yeah, last slide. I, I, let me let so, you finish. Let me let you finish. So the future, I uh, hope to give you a little overview of where Dubai sits on the BRI now. The future, we'll see the next wave of BRI investment. It probably won't be so focused on um, these big ticket infrastructure items. Anyways, as we heard, post-corona China might um, level out these investments and focus on more technology-based investments. Uh, new infrastructure, things like electric charging networks, drone security networks. 5G networks, uh, and the Belt and Road is a very broad concept. It can include anything from these infrastructure projects to uh, private sector companies coming in and investing in Dubai and localizing for the Arab market. So this will be the next wave in terms of Dubai. Cultural links will be expanded. And again, Dubai will focus on cementing its role as its trade and finance hub for Chinese companies going out to the region and also for the new trade flow being created. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Omar. Um, as I, um, I know when we were setting up this call um, and I've ha been talking to um, Omar before, um, we view Dubai as the Switzerland of, um, you know, of this part of the world. Um, and I, I, I truly think that your uh, summary of, um, um, you know, your relationships, your trade and, um, and your ongoing and your future relationships summarizes, I think, um, that yearning to continue to be the, just that. So thank you very much um, for an informed um, uh, session and a segment. Um, we have um, some really wonderful um, next segment, which is our final segment before we open um, the floor for Q and A. Um, and so I would, um, you know, it's my pleasure to bring um, Tim Cope on. Um, let me introduce Tim. Tim is an award-winning Australian adventurer, as I said, and writer based in Melbourne with a special interest in Central Asia, Mongolia, and Russia. He is most renowned as the author of On the Trail of Genghis Khan, an epic journey through the land of the nomads. This winning book, which is an award-winning book, a mix of history, adventure, and memoir details, has three-year quest to ride horses on the trail of nomads from Mongolia to the Danube in Hungary. Previously, Tim has studied as a wilderness guide in the Finnish and Russian sub-Arctic, ridden a bicycle across Russia to China and rode a boat along the Yenisei River through Siberia to the Arctic Ocean. He is also a creator of documentary films, including 
the award-winning series, The Trail of Genghis Khan. Tim leads annual trekking expeditions in Mongolia and works as a public speaker. Tim will, will conclude today's presentations with a beautiful 30-minute 30, 30 pictorial presentation of his one year spent traversing the Silk Road on horseback. So, over to you, Tim. Without much ado, we are really looking forward to this. Thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, I won't uh, take any more time to get started. Uh, but before I just start speaking, I'll just show you a, a very short video to give you a glimpse into what's to come at this evening. When I was 20 years old, my friend Chris and I were cycling across Mongolia. While struggling through the Gobi Desert one day, these amazing wild horsemen came galloping from over the horizon. They headed off to places that our bikes could never have gone. These people had a world without boundaries. From here in Mongolia stretched the great Eurasian steppe to Hungary, and their ancestors were once warriors who crossed this vast space. It inspired in me a dream to live the life of a nomad and ride a horse from Mongolia to the Danube. I never imagined what lay before me. Long nights alone, menaced by wolves and thieves, impossible mountain passes, and the most extreme climate on earth. I'd even be caught in a war between sedentary and nomad people, and face a personal tragedy that almost ended my journey. But I was driven on by an old nomad wisdom. To understand the wolf, you must put on the skin of a wolf and see through its eyes. Once again, thank you very much for, for having me. I just want to double check, is the audio coming through from the video? Absolutely. That was all good. And it it's is. absolutely a wonderful start, Tim. Over to you. Thank you very much. Well, as you saw there, when I was 21, I consider myself very lucky to have been in the middle of the Gobi Desert, uh, which, of course, you would all know, straddles the border of what is today Mongolia and Inner Mongolia in China. Uh, at that point, I was 12 months into a bicycle journey with my friend Chris. Uh, we had begun 12 months earlier in the far west of Russia. Our aim was to reach Beijing. We more or less travelled along a similar route to the Trans-Siberian, of course, a route that would eventually bypass many of the original Silk Road routes through Central Asia. But that was not what was on my mind at this stage. We had just broken our record for days without a wash, which was around about 28. Um, despite the fact that my bicycle had snapped in half, the map had blown away in, in the wind. Um, we were, oh, and by the way, my petrol stove had broken, so we were using dried dung to burn as fuel, as, as uh, people of the step do. Uh, but most importantly, we were celebrating meeting the incredible people of the step. Uh, these Mongolian horsemen and horsewomen would appear from nowhere, come galloping from over the horizon. And they would usually unfill from their deep pockets in their cloaks a handful of aro, which is a dried curd. We'd have an improvised conversation and then off they'd gallop in whichever direction they please. And they left us feeling like wimpy tourists, pushing our, our bikes through a land uh, where these people lived in conditions that range from minus 50 degrees and below in the winter uh, to 40 or 50 degrees of heat in the summer. And unlike where I'd grown up, of course, uh, they only had a couple of inches of wool felt on the edges of their tents to insulate them from those extremes. But more than that, what struck me about this world was that uh, there was no such thing essentially as private property. There were no fences. People only owned as many possessions as could fit on the back of their animals as they moved from place to place um, in, in sync, if you like, with the seasons, with nature. It represented the kind of freedom that probably a lot of young people uh, dream of, and certainly, certainly I did, but didn't know, of course, existed. Eventually, I did get to Beijing. I got home, and even before my bike was gathering cobwebs, I was voraciously reading 
about the Mongols and the Mongol Empire. Of course, growing up here, I'd learned almost nothing about them in school. And what struck me was that not only did, did the Mongols under Genghis Khan rule an empire that would survive a century and a legacy that long outlived the Genghiside uh, period, uh, it was not ruled by some aristocrat sitting in his castle in, in Rome or, or, or even anywhere in, in Asia. Uh, this was a nomad. Uh, Genghis Khan was a, a man who grew up and lived his life to the very end into his 70s on the back of a horse in a yurt tent. And somehow I felt like in much of the sedentary world, uh, it's a very incongruous concept that a nomad can also be an emperor of what became the largest contiguous land empire and uh, a land area and uh, an empire that ruled roughly uh, an area where half of the world's population now live. And that's just to give you some sense of the scale. So one day here at home, I decided that I wanted to ride a horse just like the Mongols had once done, setting out on routes that, of course, are these days also known as uh, Silk, the Silk Road. Of course, they were trading routes even long before the Mongols came along. My aim was to, to cross Central Asia following the steppes as far as the Danube River in Hungary. Now, there was one small problem. Uh, I couldn't ride a horse. I was terrified of these great big beasts. And in fact, when I was seven, I'd been put on one by my father for a photo, been bucked off, broke my arm, and I had not been back on. Uh, but I was quite determined to, to fulfill this dream. I wanted to start in Mongolia and make my way west. Uh, just, I wanted to know what it was like perhaps to get into the saddle for a young Mongol person back in the 13th century and make their way into this very different world in, in Europe. Of course, the, the Mongols are not the only people to have established a nomadic empire in Central Asia. I wanted to know about the Kazakhs, their own history, how their life now uh, was after the fall of the Soviet Union. The Kalmyks are the, the last people to make the great trek from Asia into Europe and, and back again. Half of their diaspora now live in Western Mongolia and the other half in the Republic of Kalmykia in Southern Russia, the only Buddhist Republic in geographical Europe. I wanted to know about the Cossacks and, of course, the Crimean Tatars, who you may know a little bit about now, particularly since Russia's uh, takeover of Crimea. And then there were the Hutsuls, who have inherited the descendants of Mongol horses and still live in the high mountains of the Carpathians in Ukraine. And the Hungarians, the Magyars, who came riding out of Asia back in the ninth century and established the nation that we know today. Something that tied all of these nations, all of these people and nations together was, of course, a horseback nomadic culture. The only way I saw to fulfill this trip was, of course, in the saddle. Two or three years after that moment in the Gobi on my bicycle, I bought my first horse. I was back in Mongolia and this man I'll chat about, he looked on with his mates rather nervously and he said, well, what are you going to do when the, when the, Wolves attack, what happens when the, when the thieves steal your horses? But that's not the kind of journey that I had imagined. I certainly had never imagined carrying a gun, which was something that they suggested I was crazy not to. My dream was, was to look at the world from the nomadic point of view. I wanted to, to know what had happened to these nomadic cultures since the breakdown of the Soviet Union, because the breakdown of the Soviet Union was, of course, the collapse uh, also of, this, of the Russian Empire for many of these people. Uh, countries like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan were essentially feeling a, a sense of sovereignty that they had not felt uh, since, since, since for, for, for centuries. There's a, set, there's a kind of virtue, I think, in naivety. And certainly I had to trust that by taking this great big risk in the beginning of this journey, Somehow the odds would, would fall in my favour, but on the fifth day of the trip, uh, things did not go very well. I heard this terrible neighing from my horse, and so I 
went on the dark end. Just discovered um, probably the worst thing possible. Two horses were gone. Come back! I've woken up in the tent to hear the horses galloping off. They'd been stolen. The only thing remaining was a bell that I'd put on the horses as a kind of alarm for thieves. But of course, they just pulled the bell off, jumped on and galloped away. Fortunately, I had been told before I left by a Mongolian friend that if you must, if you have a problem in Mongolia, you must solve it before the sun rises. I got up on that horse and although the previous day it had seemed like this utopian paradise, now I felt very intimidated. Where was I going to find my animals in a land where there are millions of animals running free? But I was very fortunate to find, come across a herd just before sunrise. At the tail end of that herd were my, were my animals. The nomad came up to me and suggested that, well, you must have tied your horses up really badly. Uh, they, they came to me themselves. And that wasn't true. Of course, everything was gone. My horses, the, the hobbles, even. He took me back home to his, uh, his, his tent, or known as the Gur in Mongolian, or more commonly in English as a yurt, introduced me to his family, slaughtered a goat, and told me a, a very ancient aphorism of the steppe. A man on the steppe without friends is as narrow as a finger, and a man on the steppe with friends is as wide as the steppe. The steppe, of course, being these roughly five or 6,000 miles of open plains, deserts and mountains that stretch from Asia right into, in, into Hungary to as far as the Danube. Now, in hindsight, it could have been these gentlemen who, who stole my horses, uh, but uh, I'll never quite know, and it doesn't really matter. With time, I would learn that there is an ancient tradition whereby someone can fall in love with a horse out here, manage to steal it, and get away with it, then the horse is more deserving of its new owner than it was <laughs> than it was of its original owner. In fact, it's, it's said that you should take it as a compliment if someone's trying to steal your horse. And many people might think that it's a lot easier to ride a horse in the modern era uh, with all the, the aid of technology than it might have been 800 years ago. But often I felt that that wasn't the case because during the reign of the Mongol Empire, it was possibly a time, it was a, a time at that stage of unprecedented stability, of incredible trade between these, these countries and an exchange of knowledge from Asia into Europe, uh, of course, to the subcontinent and, and further afield. Uh, the, by the reason that someone like Marco Polo and other historical travellers that you may have heard of, uh, such as the Friar Carpini, uh, who made a, a, a journey to, to Asia before Marco Polo, they were able to do it because they were using the quite safe trade routes that were established by the Mongols. They were given special passes and essentially uh, were, were given protection and escorts for much of their, their, uh, their, much of their time. I found myself very much alone. And so what I had to do, of course, according to that aphorism, was start making friends. And that didn't mean making friends with people I related to or with whom I could speak the language. It was about approaching people in the evening, asking them if I could camp. And generally speaking, they saw me as a guest. They never refused me. And uh, they looked, saw, looked upon me as someone to, to protect by the unwritten laws of the steppe. This Mongolian system requires uh, two people most of the time. Yeah, but these guys know what they're doing because they pack up their girls twice a year and off they go with all of their gears. Could be up to 50 k's away so for I'll their winter home. So i a little bit more about these nomadic people. Why it is, of course, that they're nomads in the first place they pack up their homes still these days with, with the seasons, putting most of their belongings on the back of camels in other areas on trucks or towed with, with yaks. One of the most moving experiences I had was meeting a family on the move with their, with their children. I'd been holding on to the mane of my horse, uh, trying not to look down into the gorge beside me when this lady appeared from nowhere guiding six camels down that were fully packed. 
she revealed on the back of one of those camels her baby and it left me with this sense that these people have perhaps more trust in their animals with their precious loved ones uh, than we do sometimes with fellow human beings uh, in, in, in our own society. And it left me with a deep sense of just how closely they live with their environment and have done since uh, the horse was first domesticated about five and a half thousand years ago, somewhere we believe in the northern steppes of, of Kazakhstan. It's easy for us to, to have amnesia, of course, to think that we've been driving cars forever. Of course, they've only been around a century or so. The Mongols are the ones who brought the horse to Europe, uh, to, the, to the Middle East, uh, to the subcontinent, and eventually it was embraced and became a symbol of power, much in the way that it was perceived uh, when the Mongols conquered places uh, such as Europe in the first place. Uh, of course, the Mongols today are still incredibly adaptable. Uh, most people most people may see something like this, a satellite phone, a satellite dish, sorry, as corrupting their traditional culture. But going back many centuries, the Mongols have been extraordinary at adapting uh, any, any technology that can aid them in their lifestyle uh, without changing it in, for the worse. I'm going to be running quick into Kazakhstan now. There's two metres of snow up here in eastern Kazakhstan in winter. If I don't move, I'm going to be stuck here till March. But it's just bloody hard. The fingers just get totally frozen, tying up the saddles, and the tent's just covered in rime and frost. It's just cold. It's like the earth's just been entombed in ice. Kazakhstan, at the beginning of the coldest winter in about 40 years in that northeast corner of the country, you can see the, the dreaded zhud was beginning to fall. This is what they would call in Mongolian a glass zud. What happens is this ice builds up to the point that uh, the, the, the grass falls over, you get a little bit of melt and it refreezes, forming a steel hard cap of ice over the land. The animals can't reach, reach the, the food. Uh, they begin to go hungry. They say that horses that do survive until spring in these conditions are sometimes naked. Uh, by that time because they end up resorting to eating the hair off, off each other's bodies. Now, Kazakhstan, for me, ended up being by far the most difficult and the most interesting part of my journey. And I was entering a country that was in a deep sense of a, a difficult transition. In the 19, early 1930s, late 19, uh, 1920s, Stalin's industrialisation campaign reached Kazakhstan and within a space of a couple of winters, 2.2 uh, million nomads roughly died in what was essentially an artificial famine. Those nomads who did survive that era had no choice but to integrate into this new Soviet uh, reality, only for that to come crashing down and within a couple of generations in the 1990s. I was entering a country where they no longer have sufficient traditional knowledge to recreate that traditional life, uh, but nor did they have the support systems of the Soviet state. And some of the people, uh, such as this woman, had lived through all of the traumatic periods of the 20th century, and it must have been extraordinarily confusing for her uh, to, to go through so much sacrifice only to do it in such dire circumstances. This man, mostly was worried about me. He, he saw me as this naive Australian who had no idea what lay ahead. His name was Asset. He decided that he would uh, accompany me for the first couple of weeks, introduce me to Kazakh customs. And at the end of our time together, he said, Tim, you need a friend on this long road, someone to keep you warm at night in the tent and protect you from the, uh, the wolves and the thieves. So he gave me Tigan, this tiny little pup who was leaping off the snow just to uh, get his paws out of the cold. Dig in. Come on. Come on, mate. Ah. Hey. No. Dig in. No. Why? I didn't think 
reckon would survive more than a couple of weeks. But uh, as we set off, I became uh, he became inseparable to me. Uh, I'm sure he was thinking to himself, "Thank God, Kim is protecting me from the wolves." But at least we were starting to get some some really good sleep. One of the things I remember in the winter was putting him inside a great big bag, zipping him up, we'd stay warm. And then when dinner began to boil, the bag would start hopping towards the petrol stove. And that's when I would go and open the diffraction and drop a little bit of uh, pig fat inside for him. Uh, to every, and he'd gulp it up. It would be our nightly treat. Often I'd come across these uh, two or three century old graves out in these very open spaces. And they, they did provide a great sense of comfort. Our set had told me I should always sleep in them. And by doing that, the old people of the step would look after me. Now, I never did that, but they gave me comfort for another reason. It gave me a sense that I was on the right path. A hundred years ago, about 96% of Kazakhs uh, were nomadic. In the current era, uh, less than 5% are nomadic. It felt as if I was pulling together the pieces and trailing and, and <clears throat> literally on the trail of a culture uh, unseen. There were some people out there, of course, like this man, Buzzy Beck, who had been herding camels all of his life. And it was an extraordinary sight to watch him get on the camel at dawn and rise up. And there was that picture of symbiosis between uh, humans and animals that has so transformed life across the planet. It started to get very cold, minus 25, minus 30, then the minus 40s began to hit. The daylight was also very short. And when this photo was taken, I was very worried. It was two days to Christmas. One of the horses had an injury in its hoof. The tent was falling apart. I did not want to be out here alone in a, in a place in central Kazakhstan called the Starving Steps. So I pulled the map out and decided I'd have to evacuate to the nearest town about 100 k's away, a place called Ak Akai. Now, in these conditions, it's quite well known that the Mongolians would have mounted up and marched on, often with the, the oil of marmots uh, rubbed on their faces to protect them from frostbite. I had a bit of vodka. Uh, which I had been advised should be rubbed on the paws of my dog and on my own hands if needed to keep them from freezing up. Alas, Akbakai was not the refuge I thought it might be. It was a semi-bankrupt uh, at that stage gold mining town, one of many towns that uh, was based solely on the industry of extraction and being left to its own devices uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, these cities are known across the, the former Soviet Union as mono. Monogorods. A man took me into his, his hut. I was alone and I wasn't alone. And I was warm, but in the morning, this is the first thing I saw. This is Grisha and his mate Vitka. Uh, together, they were notorious local men who had lost their truck driving licenses and been stuck here for several years. They went out onto the street and caught a couple of uh, street pigeons. There wouldn't, was no food for my animals. And yet, on the other hand, one of my, my horses did have this terrible abscess. It could, could not walk. I did not know what to do. I ended up being stuck in Akbakai for three months. I got sick. Uh, the, my dog, Tegan, was stolen by some unemployed mine worker. And it was this man, by duck who came to the rescue. Uh, he found Tegan after a week. Uh, he, Tegan was found uh, in really terrible shape, being locked in a shed, hadn't been fed. He was revived. By by dark uh, with a bowl of vodka and raw eggs, and he was put in a sauna for a day. Uh, during this period, by duck and the other people in this town, they said to me, Tim, every single time you try to leave this place, you're causing more trouble for yourself. You need to uh, sit back, relax, have a cup of tea, everything will be okay. We they have a, co a saying in Kazakh that if you ever have to rush in life, rush slowly. And that for me was a pivotal moment in the journey where. I realigned my sights and I realised this journey would simply need to take as long as it needed to. And after all, I had come on this adventure wanting to experience a world that wasn't measured in the dollars and cents, the nine to five. I wanted to know what it was like to, to experience these hardships. And the harder it became, the better insight I had into 
the people who had ridden this this road for, for centuries and also the people who are born into this life today. The snows melted in spring and I had my chance to ride out. The greens began to break up the monochromes of winter. The people emerged from uh, their homes. It was time for the camels to have their spring haircuts. But before I knew it, it was searing hot. And the most difficult part of my journey was just about to begin crossing the deserts of central and western Kazakhstan, a place that is narrated even in the time of the Mongol Empire as uh, being a, a desperate desert. Uh, uh, Carpini talks about there being uh, bones and skulls of people that had perished there as he, as he was escorted through these very open lands. The only way to survive was to ride at night time. And I wasn't able just to, 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 to stay awake all, all night because sleeping in temperatures that reached 50 degrees sometimes was just impossible. So I'd fall asleep on the horse on the ground, wake up with, uh, with chicken in my, my, my arms. It was, of course, the people who came to my rescue, the Kazakhs, just like the Mongols, they have a saying that uh, first time as a guest, you're a friend, second time you're part of the family, third time, well, you can even stay for life. And that's the way that I was treated by 60 to 70 families uh, of many different kinds. And I learned this wonderful saying that mountains never meet, but people do, an expression I believe by nomads uh, about the importance, the precious nature of being human and our ability to have human relationships in the first place. Now, many people may read the history like I did of the Mongols and hear about their extraordinary uh, <clears throat> achievements of riding one way across the steppe and back again. Uh, you, may be, you may eventually come to believe that it's some kind of nice big green field that you might be able to gallop across in a few days. Uh, to give you a perspective, it would take me eventually three and a half years. What those riders experienced by the time they reached Europe is unimaginable. Uh, they had witnessed cultures, landscapes, knowledge uh, that was beyond the imagination of Europeans, medieval Europeans, who at that stage mostly probably hadn't gone further than the, than the nearest parish. Made it to the Azov Sea. First time on the horses. I've seen the sea since I began, almost two years ago. Christmas in the air, and the horses are the moving a lot faster, a lot more easily. Mia is probably the same thing that uh, struck the, the weary Mongolians who, who arrived and conquered, uh, in fact, the, the, the Russian or the Kiev Rus armies way back in the 13th century. It was just this abundance of grass to let the animals feed up. Uh, to go to bed at night, listening, them, listening to them filling their stomachs. I don't think anything more. Uh, can bring a, a smile to a horseman or a horsewoman's uh, face at the end of a, a long travel. Crimea is an extraordinary place, a crossroads uh, of trade, a crossroads between the, the roots of the, the trade routes of the Black Sea and, of course, the Silk Road trails of the Eurasian steppe. I haven't got time today to, to explain, but uh, just as in the 13th century, Crimea is, is a real flashpoint um, in, as a geopolitical uh, <clears throat> strategic uh, land, land, land formation. Uh, when I arrived there, uh, there was already a great sense of conflict between NATO, Russia, Ukraine, and also the indigenous peoples of Crimea, the, the Crimean Tatars. We might be able to go into a little bit of that later. But one other very interesting, interesting thing about Crimea, it was... It was through the ports of what's now known as Theodosia, uh, then known as Kaffa, I believe that the plague was actually delivered, if you like, 
by unintentionally by the Mongols, via Genoese slave traders to Europe, a plague, of course, which not only devastated Europe and uh, and Africa, and, but but also devastated uh, the Mongols themselves. And some historians believe that the the plague, just as a pandemic uh, is doing partly today, uh, did bring about the end or accelerated the end and demise of the Mongol Empire. You can see here that Tigan had now grown into a, an adult. He was a real man of a dog. Uh, he was fiercely guiding the way. He was the first to meet the people. Uh, he was so spoiled that he would no longer accept bread from strangers without jam and cream. He was blessed by a priest in this picture here and even offered his own hotel room. He certainly became the modern Genghis Khan, at least in the dog, dog world. I did receive a letter at some stage from Rus Russia suggesting that he'd left about 12 children behind on one of their uh, research farms. And the deep forests and treacherous peaks of the Carpathians. So we're just coming to the end here. Uh, if I've got enough time to, to finish, Schiller, or do we need to stop? Tim, this is so fascinating. We're going to give you some more time. Just, just go ahead and finish um, because we don't want to stop halfway. We feel like we're at the end of the movie and we want to see the end. So go ahead. <laughs> okay. So uh, if you show me images like these in the Carpathians before I set off, I might have become scared and turned tail and gone straight home. Uh, but the truth is I'd always known that these Carpathians were looming on the horizon, a place where one small slip and we would have all gone down the mountain together. Uh, but by now, of course, the experience with all of the unexpected challenges that equipped me uh, with enough skills. And it was just a pleasure to cross these some, same mountains where the Mongols had once tread the, the Hungarians at the time naively believed that the Carpathians would be their saviour. The, they only had to block the passes and the Mongols would not get through. Of course, the Mongols galloped down the passes and had defeated the Hungarian army within a matter of days, uh, by which stage they had absolutely no chance. I crossed the border into Hungary and it was a very different ending. Uh, to where this journey had begun. Word had spread. People escorted me those last six weeks to the Danube River, uh, including horseback archers who were trying to recreate the culture of their ancestors, the Magyars. I'm introduced to Kosho Leos, who's famous in Hungary for reviving the art of horseback archery. He's dedicated his life to living by the ideals of the ancient nomad warrior and he's got thousands of followers worldwide. It's awe-inspiring. He's able to shoot off six arrows in 12 seconds at a full gallop and hit the target every time. It was these warriors that demolished the feudal systems of Europe and paved the way for light horse cavalry that was to become the standard for European armies of the future. So before I knew it, uh, I had taken those last few hoof steps. This is a place called Opustase, uh, on the Hungarian Pusta near, near the steppe, near the Danube. My mother was up there, ambassador from Australia, from Kazakhstan, from Mongolia. It was a, anything but an anticlimax to, to think back on where this journey had begun. Uh, had I discovered some of the spirit of the Mongols and the nomads, uh, actually much more than I had ever imagined. And I think by traveling from East, to West, I was able to recognise and find that culture. In every country I went to, including Hungary, which ironically, of course, had been devastated by the Mongols, they saw a shadow of their own ancestor in me and my journey. And so I was fortunately embraced. I set off not knowing a soul. I'd ended uh, with, with hundreds. I'd learned when to hold the reins, when to loosen my grip and learn something new, like with Victor and Grisha, to have patience. I'd, I'd found in Tigan an incredible friend who I couldn't have lived without, and the journey had prepared me for those great big challenges, although not all of them. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention is that in Ukraine I discovered by a satellite phone that my father Andrew had been killed in a, in a car accident here in Australia, so I was forced 
to actually return to Australia. Uh, it was the most difficult uh, period of, of my life to return to, to Ukraine and, and carry on. And I felt that a lot of the things I'd learned from nomadic culture had helped, did help me in a way uh, deal with that. But here I was three and a half years after departing, a year and a half late, uh, reaching the Danube, believing in this Kazakh, and I believe uh, a much more universal saying, actually, that tr you should trust in fate, or trust in God, but always tie up the camel. The Danube River uh, was looking back at me as if to say, what took you so long? I, there's no question that in the modern era, I could have flown from uh, from Mongolia to Europe in a, in a matter of hours. I could have taken the Trans-Siberian. I could have uh, driven across roads through Central Asia. Probably could have walked faster given the bureaucracy I went through. But I firmly believe that in the modern era when we can still, we can vicariously experience the world through the smartphone in our pocket, uh, there is no substitute for going out and embracing and learning about new cultures, new people, and, and, and of course, history, and learning about the, the, the nomads of the steppe, uh, those people who facilitated extraordinary cultural and economic exchange, um, it's changed the perspective of, uh, for me, of, uh, of my life and my perspective of, of the world. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Wow. How can we, uh, I mean, I'm just still comprehending everything that I've uh, seen on screen and listened to um, and, and just realize that um, humanity has so much to offer. Um, and, and, and I think your journey is just, um, yeah, just a, you know, a, a little lens into, into that, um, that great, um, well, expedition and adventure. Um, so I have got um, some very specific questions for you, and I know we're a um, little bit out of time, but I may just take um, five minutes um, just to um, ask a, a couple of questions. One, I think um, the language, um, a lot of questions have come about asking about how did you overcome the barrier of language? How did you communicate with, with these wonderful people? I was very fortunate when I was 19, I studied in Finland and I began to learn and study Russian at that point. So by the time I started this journey, I spoke quite fluent Russian. And uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, sub the, the republics of Southern Russia, Ukraine, uh, Russia, Russian was, was um, not, only, not only gave me wonderful insight and ability to communicate, but made it possible. Uh, I think without Russian language, it would have been uh, impossible. Having said that, my Mongolian language was not good, and outside of the, the cities, uh, Russian is not spoken that widely. Uh, that was more difficult. Uh, I had uh, a, a translator at one stage, but I want to make the point here that uh, when I first arrived in Mongolia by bicycle, people saw me as a kind of novelty who'd landed as if from space, uh, but by horse. Strangely, I was very deeply familiar to them. Uh, they knew exactly how I felt, what I needed, uh, what condition, what state the horses were in. And so the language of the horse was something that tied this, uh, this journey together from start to finish. And uh, may I just um, also ask if any of the panellists want to ask Tim a question, um, now's the time to do it. Um, before we finally wrap up, because I know there are some questions which are very much more economical in nature, but I think um, we're going to stick with um, Tim's presentation because I think it's just the highlight in terms of wrapping up. Um, you know, what uh, we've learned is, you know, the Silk Road is there, we can, you know, walk that, we, we, you know, but what you've taught us is the um, adventure of human spirit um, the, vulnerab the vulnerability of humanity, the hospitality, the simplicity, um, you know, is a great lesson for entrepreneurs because in, in, in doing a business, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with humans. We're dealing with exchange. We're dealing with, um, you know, um, gaining and losing. And, uh, and I think uh, it's just been, you know, captivating the, the stories you've just said. And whatever happened to Tegan? Uh, at the at the end of the journey, I had some big decisions. I left Tiggin behind and also the horses. The horses were given away to an orphanage 
that have been looking for horses to run a program for the kids. I came home, it was going to cost $10,000 to bring Tigan uh, out to Australia uh, and be beyond the financial challenge at the time. The, the fact was he was a Kazakh dog and he would need to become an EU citizen with a passport before I could apply for permits into Australia. Uh, 12 months passed and eventually I got an email from Australian Customs to say that I, I had the permit. And that was when I raised the, the funds and we, we got him swiftly transported to Vienna by, by taxi from near Budapest. Uh, he, was, he flew Emirates to, uh, to Dubai. He had a night in a $500 uh, air conditioned room there, I believe. And uh, then he made his way to Australia. Uh, and that was the beginning of another great adventure for him here. Uh, we lived together all up 14 years, unfortunately. He, he passed away a year and a half ago. Wow. Amazing. Um, so any of the panellists for some final questions um, at all um, for Tim or any of the other pa panellists, feel free to um, ask it. But um, just as a um, general vote of thanks that I think I'm getting a lot of comments to say that all the presentations were excellent. Um, you know, we've had um, such a lovely, lovely night um, sharing lots of different ideas, thoughts, journeys and and of course Tim um, you know is is, uh, is absolutely been a pleasure to obviously have seen that pictorial adventure um, so um, does anyone have any questions for Tim at all no okay all right so oh. I think I'm um, sorry sorry Omar did you I, I have a question go ahead uh, Tim, just wanted. I'm curious about your travels through Mongolia, and and particularly since we are talking about Silk Road and empires, and the fact that Mongols ruled over China, you know the Yuan Dynasty. Uh, what what? I mean, how do the Mongols see modern China, contemporary China? Well, I mean, some historians or many historians would argue that, of course. The architects of modern China, Yuan Dynasty, were of course the, the Mongols. Uh, uh, and however, Mongolians, I think, and this goes back to the time of Genghis Khan and uh, and, and, and before, uh, they viewed China through a deep cultural mindset as nomads. Uh, mm -hmm. They 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 it, like they have done for uh, for for centuries. Uh, the nomads kind of look down on sedentary cultures. They say they they see their way of doing things as being as being superior, um, and that that seems to be fairly consistent throughout Central Asia. Whether it be the way that Kazakh nomads have traditionally seen sedentary Uzbek Uzbek civilization, uh, the way that uh, <clears throat> nomads in, in in places like Hungary saw the sedentary people of Central and Western Europe, uh, but um, Look, Mongolia is in a in a particularly unenviable position, really, being uh, at the mercy of both China and and Russia. Uh, mm. They 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 have taken out a policy since the 1990s of of uh, align, aligning themselves with a third power, uh, i.e., the West, uh, mm. namely namely America. Uh, but um, I think they they. Uh, they kind of walk a similar tightrope than I experienced in my journey, uh, which is there is a very fine line between friend and foe. And they see China as both a friend and a foe. They see uh, Russia traditionally more, more as, a, as a friend and a go-to for support uh, because of his, because historical reasons and cultural reasons. Um, so it's a, it's a very complicated, a very, very complica complicated scenario. Uh, for, but, but as far as I know, I spoke at the Silk Road uh, Summit for the UNWTO in Xi'an in China a few years ago and also in Mongolia and, and both uh, Mongolia at a political level um, of the, have been embracing the Belt and Road initiatives um, mm. and, uh, and China has, uh, has of course, uh, considered Mongolia to be a, a fairly important play an, an important role in that. Uh, particularly as a transit state between them and, and Russia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
Thank you. So I, I, I think we should, um, we, you know, should call it a night. Um, I know that there are uh, lots of people um, raising hands and uh, wanting to um, ask, uh, you know, the panelists some questions, but I think it is late um, for us here in Melbourne. Um, so I just want to conclude by saying thank you to each of our panelists, Dr. Pradeep Taneja, Mr. Imtiaz Restagar, Mr. Omar Khan, Mr. Daniel Sellers and Tim Corp, who have absolutely, absolutely given us such a pleasurable night tonight, taking us through all of the history um, of the Silk Road and, um, you know, just, just bringing the economics, the humanity, um, uh, the endeavor, um, and, and surely leaving us with um, my favorite, um, you know, sort of saying of all of this is, if we have a problem, then we must resolve it before sunrise. I think that was a classic. Um, I think amazing. Thank you very much, um, every single person on the on the panel. You have done an amazing, amazing job um, for bringing this all together. Um, finally, um, uh, there is one last poll which I'm going to launch um, now, just, um, you know, questions about Thai and about the event itself so that we can understand what you like and we can uh, ensure that we are meeting your demands and uh, looking to, um, you know, host other such eventful um, evenings. So thank you again, everyone, um, for such a beautiful evening. And um, yeah, good night and good day. Uh, be safe and be well. Thank you.